Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales, Tales from, from Outer, outer space. 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 Hope you enjoy. Story number one. At all cost is a human-only expression. Written by Damaged Dice DM. At all cost is a human expression. Now, I'm not saying that other species don't understand sacrifice. It's just that the other ones weigh the cost and benefit of their actions. Nowhere is there more prevalent in human culture than a military attitude towards civilian casualties. Now, they get plenty mad when they lose brothers and sisters at arms, but they are only species that does not specifically target civilians. Whether you agree with it or not, you do well to follow that lead or end up like the Julux did in the attack of the human colony on Postremo Filius V in 3186 BC. The war started the way the most do. A small human colony found an uninhabited planet and settled there, made it home, and begun a terraforming process. Note that none of the humans that were contributing efforts to this would live to see its completion, when the great-great-grandchildren would be able to go outside and breathe clean air without protective suits by the time they were adults. Another human trait of working towards goals none would be around to see finished. They have some sayings about planting a tree that you will not enjoy the shade of. It's a strange concept to most species. Around 20 years into the process, the planet caught the eye of the Judex, a race that I am told look like bipedal porcupines to the humans. They are what can only be described as a parasitic culture, stealing technology and worlds from other species. This strategy had served them well and, at this time, were one of the more powerful races in the galaxy. They saw that they had been a garbage planet was now, by their standards, a utopia. Even if by human standards, it was still a toxic environment. They demanded the humans evacuate their homes. When they refused, the Julik started orbital bombardment and blockaded the planet. The colony sent out distress signal, but it was intercepted and communications were jammed. If it had not been for a random freighter that was passing by the system, seeing all the activity around the planet and reporting it, it would have been years before anyone knew what happened. The closest military ship was the Avis. More of a troop transport than a warship, it was assigned to the system near Postremo Filius V on the humanitarian mission. Most of its fighter craft replaced the transports with light armament for defense. Upon receiving a call from the freighter, they left orbit immediately, burning towards Postremo Filius V as fast as they could. During the trip, they learned that the Julex had the entire armada parked around Postremo Filius V, and the closest human reinforcements would be over a week away, even at FTL. But they were still on the way regardless. Long-range sensors on the Avis detected 27 warships in orbit clustered on the northern hemisphere in the Telltale Bombardment Formation. Captain Lisa Zinn called all available hands to the ship's hangar. Her voice rang clear in the room and was relayed through comms to all still at stations. There are 400,000 civilians on that planet, and for now, we are all they have. We have a plan, but it's one that I cannot in good conscience order you to carry out. It will be volunteer only. Anyone not willing to participate is welcome to take one of the 200 emergency pods. There'll be more than enough to keep you alive until reinforcements come to pick you up, and I will broadcast a message that you are in no way to be punished for your choice to stay behind. But if you choose to stay, no, and this is a one-way trip. You should contact your next of kin with any messages that you wish to leave them. They will be transmitted before we get into system. We have a lot of work to do and no time to spare. If you're with me, meet me here in an hour. Several hours later, Avis breached the room of the system, looking worse for wear, its rear armor plate stripped off and exposing the rear inner hull. The enemy was never going to see the back of the ship anyways, and it was needed elsewhere. The Julix fleet did not move to intercept, possibly seeing a single transport ship as a little threat, especially with them not having any ground force deployment on the planet. On board, the Avis captains and ensured that the crew messages were sent in triplicate, sure that they were received. She looked down the ship's shield status, showing a deep red areas in the rear that no longer had the plating that they had stripped off in the most extreme hull speed spacewalk salvage history had ever seen. 
She had until this point intentionally ignored one of the screens, but as she looked towards it now, a sad smile crept on her face. Emergency life pod status. 200 available. The Avis came into weapons range, guns blazing, unleashing a full spread of laser fire and plasma turrets into the capital ship of the Dulux Armada. Minimal damage. Several Dulux cruisers broke formation to engage, closing the distance quickly. Captain Zinn opened a channel, broadcasting full spectrum, and the first mate dropped a needle on an ancient device on the bridge the captain had brought up from her quarters. A gift from her husband when she was given the position of captain of the Avis, the round black disc rotated slowly. The tune was set to a low drum and bagpipes. A sweet, smooth Irish woman's voice built as the song progressed. Scratches from the age of the machine accompanied the sound. The captain pounded her hand on the arm of a chair with a beat and sung along as she gave the signal, and the Avis began to barrel roll. As it did, a swarm of what from a distance looked like angry bees erupted from its belly as every transport, life pod, and spare munition fled its thrusters as she rolled aft, barreling towards the capital ship. The engines roared to life, and the transports, their holds bursting with fuel and improvised explosions covered in the slapped-on hull armor. The life pods had missiles welded to their exterior. The pilots fired them, accelerating the craft towards the unprepared Judex fleet, bending the soldiers to the seats for the last ride that they would ever take, as they all began to sing on the open channel as well. The sound of 1,700 soldiers singing and banging their fists to the Shannon's beat played on every receiver within Elijah. My love is called away from me to travel forth upon the sea. I fear he won't return to me. The men say, Sally, yo-ho. He fears not wind, nor sleet, nor hail. I beg him to stay to no avail. The salt and sail find wind to his tail. Carry him far, yo ho. One week later, several Terran ships broke into the system. They expected a fight, but what they found was a floating debris of 27 Judex ships, 200 life pods, dozens of twisted transports, and the Avis listing aimlessly just beyond the Judex capital ship, broken. Two. The Dulux had taken a life of 37,000 settlers and 1,700 soldiers. The messages of the soldiers sent to their families began to be shared to the public with their permission. The rally cry began to crescendo on all human held territories. Less than a year later, the human armada was parked over Dulux's homeworld to accept their unconditional surrender. The papers were signed on board the human fleet's newest capital ship. Memento Avum, which was captained by Jando Zinn, Lisa Zinn's youngest son. The terms of the treaty stipulated that the Judex would be confined to their homeworld for a period of 2,000 years, and all stolen technology would be removed from their position and returned to its owners. End of story. Story number two. Human Hazing, written by Clonk 3D. Memo, Human Hazing, to manager level staff and above. Priority, urgent. Good rotation to you all. As you are all well aware, HR is planning on hiring hundreds of humans from recently established colony around the star known as New Soul 3. It has been discovered that part of the department onboarding procedures must be changed when it comes to humans. As you may be aware, humans come from a high grav cradle. This means that they are incredibly dense. It also appears to mean that they are incredibly dense. This combined with the fact that they are persistence hunters by nature means that once you give them a command, they will follow that command to completion. Thus, giving any human the initial onboarding command aptitude test is prohibited. So far, not a single human has failed to complete the assigned task no matter how impossible the task is. For example, one human was tasked with procuring an antimatter panini press. They somehow found someone willing to make an antimatter power supply, the kind used as backups in capital ships, and incorporate a panini press into it. The company spent 3 to the power of 10 red credits to pay for the item. 
Another human spent four work cycles sweeping the dust collector room before the supervisor found them and told them to stop. They were supposed to be assembling phaser arrays, and we are still behind on phaser array assembly due to the long run time of the test. The following characteristics should be considered the result of the initial onboarding command aptitude test. Dogged, loyal, creative, vindictive. The last one is because it seems that humans fully know the assigned task is impossible and do it anyway as a retaliation to perceive slight of being given the test. Safety message to the memo. If it looks like goo, then call the sanitation crew. End of story. I just quickly want to thank the Tier 5 patrons and channel members. Alithia Barkey, Cam Maxwell, Casper Arnholtz, Albard and Gaster, Arcadian, Lord Azrakal, and Joe Kambaka.